Today we're going to be looking at plasma cutting. We're going to discuss setup and operation of a plasma cutter along with some helpful techniques. One of the issues you have to deal with when plasma cutting is moisture. Moisture is the arch enemy of plasma cutters. Now we have always put a water trap with our units. But a lot of people believe this is an air dryer. This is not a technically an air dryer. This is a water trap and a particulate filter. This is great for catching slugs of water, but it doesn't do a lot to dry the moisture in the air. When it comes to air dryers, you can spend as little or as much as you want to on air drying equipment. Now, I went down to our local retail box store and bought this desiccant type air dryer for eight bucks. It contains a silica gel, which goes from blue to pink when it's saturated with moisture. Now, the silica gel can either be baked or disposed of and refilled. Now this is very simple to install because it has fittings on either end and you can simply install it right at your uh, water trap. Now you can also install one at your air compressor if you have to. Actually having a couple air dryers installed is not a bad idea as long as you don't restrict the airflow too much. Uh, typically I like to see customers install one at the plasma cutter and one at the compressor. To me this is one of the most economical choices. The silica gel is relatively inexpensive and you can buy large quantities of it and just refill it as needed. One of the things we need to discuss is the air compressor. If you're going to run a pancake type compressor, you're going to be very disappointed in the performance of the plasma cutter. You need at least 5 CFM at 90 PSI to make things work properly. Although we rate them down to 3.5 CFM, that's for light duty cutting and only occasional use. But if you're going to be doing continuous cuttings, you're going to need at least 5 CFM on any of our plasma cutters. Running continuously, you wear your compressor out much faster, especially if you use a oilless type compressor. One of the issues you need to decide on is whether you need 110 or 220 volt compressors. Uh, my advice to you is not to go cheap on the compressor. It's only going to hurt the performance of the plasma cutter. The question comes up often, what pressure should you set it at? Now that's going to depend on your torch. If you've got an AG or SG series torch, um, like a SG55 or AG60, uh, or even a P80, you probably want to cut somewhere between 50 to uh, 65 PSI. With the S45, you're going to want to cut somewhere between 55 and 65 PSI. And our other torches, like the Trafamet series torches that we use, uh, on the high frequency units, you're probably going to want to cut around 70 PSI. Anywhere between 65 to 75 PSI will probably work. Now, most of those torches come with a special flow meter you can use to set the unit up. Uh, regardless of the air pressure, you, you measure the flow. Now, as you can see here, we've got a recommendation to 90 PSI for plasma. Now, when you're cutting um, with any of our plasma cutters, supply pressure shouldn't be more than 90 PSI. Uh, the recommended cutting pressure for this torch with this unit is 55 to 70, and that's a pretty good range for most of our torches. This is our S45 torch. This is a torch that you'll find throughout the industry, uh, the same consumables interchange. It's a good torch to use as an example to show you the different parts that you'll typically find within a torch. To begin with, we have the cup or heat shield. Now this is designed to hold everything in and together. Next, we have the nozzle. Inside, you're going to have an uh, electrode. And the electrode can unscrew. And in the center, you're going to have a special little tiny insert that's in that. And you probably won't be able to see it if you look at it, but on some consumables, you can see a faint outline. The center of it is typically made of hafnium. I've put the electrode back in the torch head for reference because what we have next is the swirl ring. Now the swirl ring uh, is found in many of our torches. Some of our torches do not have this, but particularly S45 and the other Trafamet torches that we carry in our line use a swirl ring. Uh, this is very important to the function of this torch. Uh, if it's not there, you won't get a plasma arc. Although we don't use this exact torch anymore, we still use the same consumables in some of our torches. Now this is an AG60, and you're going to find that it's a little different. This is a uh, ceramic cup here, and you have your um, chrome-plated nozzle here, and you've got a bullet-shaped electrode. Now, we're talking about moisture. You can see the swirl marks around this here. 
Now this is more typical of what you're going to find when you have had moisture in a line. If you start to experience arc problems where it's arcing off to the side, check your cup because typically what you'll find is that your cup has been uh, cracked. Now a crack will happen because you drop it or it gets too hot. Maybe you've even burned the cup up and you've got a piece of the brass that's exposed on the inside. Other art problems can include a loss of the swirl ring if it's got one. And also with the S45 torch you may have a problem with the uh, the blowback start and this piston may not be retracting like it should or it could be getting stuck or anything. Make sure that this is retracting and this part of the blowback type start with the uh, Power Ultra 205 and the Power Plasma 50. Make sure that the cup is coming in contact with these pins on either side. Sometimes these pins will get stuck. They're spring loaded. Make sure that they're standing up good and when you put the cup on they're actually making good contact. One additional issue if you're experiencing intermittent arc sometimes, you actually find that the wire inside the switch may have gotten pulled off the terminal. One of the problems with plasma cutting is that you have to watch your torch angle and torch height. You've got to make sure that you're not more than about an eighth of an inch off the metal while you're cutting. If, if you can, you want to be even closer. You don't need to be touching the metal unless you're under 30 amps. Now while you're cutting, uh, holding a straight line is difficult. Sometimes you can use roller guides, which we sell, or you can use a, the standoff uh, that comes with the torch. Uh, I choose not to use it because I'm experienced enough now that I can hold my own standoff and do quite well. Uh, make sure the standoff is angled the way that you need it for cutting. If it's turned sideways and you're trying to cut against the grain, uh, it's not going to flow with you very well. So when you're using a standoff, make sure that you've got your uh, wheels on your standoff lined to the direction of cut perfectly. Another issue you may have is torch angle. When you're cutting, you don't want too much torch angle because it'll, it'll cause a problem with the cut. Uh, you don't want too much lead. You don't want much, too much drag in the cut. You want to keep it as upright as possible. Uh, on thin material, you may want a little lead. But typically on thicker material, you want to cut straight down and parallel to the metal as much as you can. Typically when you're cutting, you want to start just off the side of the metal. If you want to pierce, you need to angle the torch to start the arc and then work the torch vertical as the metal is pierced through. If you start straight down, all you're going to do is burn up your cup here and burn up your uh, consumable here and you're going to have a nasty mess uh, because all the sparks are just going to want to bounce right back onto the torch itself. If you're at an angle, they're going to come out at an angle. So wherever your sparks are, you need to make sure there's nothing in that vicinity to catch fire. What we cut a while ago was 3 8 of an inch. Now customers ask me how to set up the plasma cutter for different thicknesses. Uh, the minimum amperage on our plasma cutter is 20 amps and that's good for 1 8 of an inch. After that I tell them for every additional 8 of an inch uh, over the first 8 of an inch you want to add 10 more amps. So if you've got 30 amps you're going to be able to cut uh, a quarter inch of material. If you got 40 amps, it's going to be about 3 8 and 50 amps, well you're going to be up to half inch on that. Now that's a pretty good rule of thumb. It doesn't always work. You'll actually be able to go over that typically, but it's a good cutting speed that you're going to get with that type of setting. One of the questions we get uh, a lot of time is the maximum and minimum cut of a unit. Uh, to make a simple answer, on the low end there's really no minimum cut that you'll uh, be limited to. It's going to depend on the diameter of your consumable. Um, you can get a smaller consumable uh, with a smaller hole and cut a finer kerf, but even with a large consumable you can still cut this metal. Now if you've got a too large of a consumable, it'll probably overheat some real thin metal and curl up, but you'll still be able to get it cut in half. 
Now, if you've got a question about our plasma cutters or any plasma cutting in general, please feel free to give us a call. Thanks for watching.